Okay, so uh, we're going to start with our next set of talks. And uh, our first speaker is going to be Sergei Tsagankov, who's going to be talking about low-level accretion. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I have quite general talk uh, title of my talk because I'm going to discuss few interesting observational effects appearing in the case of very low accretion onto highly magnetized neutron stars. And it means that we are studying X-ray pulsars. So I guess there is no need to detail the introduction. I just want to remind you that these objects uh, have neutron stars with very strong magnetic field, about 10 to 12, 10 to 13 Gauss. Uh, they are parts of uh, binary systems. They accrete matter from optical companion, usually via the accretion disk. And due to so strong magnetic field, uh, this accretion disk is disrupted at some radius, which is called magnetospheric radius. So Alessandro already uh, mentioned this radius. This is radius where magnetic pressure equals to the ram pressure of infalling radius, of, of infalling matter. And <clears throat> usually people use uh, alpha radius, which is calculated for spherical free fall uh, uh, accretion from, from infinity. And if we are talking about accretion disk, then usually people introduce some parameter, psi, which is, should be about 0.5. And to be able to follow my talk, we have to introduce another characteristic radius of the accretion onto highly magnetized neutron stars. It's called uh, correlation radius. This is radius where stellar rotation of the neutron star equals to the Keplerian uh, frequency. OK, immediately from these two definitions, we can introduce uh, some prediction of so-called propeller effect, which claims that accretion is possible only if the magnetospheric radius is smaller than correlation radius, because otherwise, uh, accretion will be stopped by the centrifugal barrier. It is very easy to understand uh, what happens here using analogy of fastly rotating carousel. So just imagine that you want to jump in into fastly rotating carousel. Obviously, uh, you are able to do it only if your velocity is roughly the same as velocity of the, of the carousel. If your velocity is high, it's not a problem. You can just decelerate and then jump in. So exactly the same happens in the case of rotating Newton star. So uh, matter rotates in the disk with the Keplerian velocity, so we have to compare field lines uh, velocity with the Keplerian one. So it means that, as I said already, uh, accretion is possible only if magnetospheric radius is smaller than the correlation radius. OK, then uh, we can consider what would happen from observational point of view in the case of some specific source. Let's consider a uh, transient pulsar with variable mass accretion rate. Let's start from high mass accretion rates and go towards lower mass accretion rates. So when we have high mass accretion rate, we have small magnetospheric radius. We have direct accretion. And luminosity can be calculated with this equation, where R is a radius of the neutron star. Uh, since magnetospheric radius depends on the mass accretion rate, when we decrease mass accretion rate, the magnetospheric radius is increasing. And at some point, uh, it equals to the correlation radius. Accretion is stopped. And at the same mass accretion rate, we expect very sharp drop of the luminosity. Because now we have to put here, uh, instead of radius of the neutron star, radius of correlation, which is much, much larger. OK, so we can combine these three trivial equations to get very useful equation for this limiting luminosity of transition to the propeller effect. So this is it. OK, this, this is limiting luminosity, which is, as you can see, function of fundamental parameters of the neutron star. It's magnetic field, strength, and pulse period. OK, as you can see, the theoretical part of introduction is, is very trivial. Uh, what do we know about this effect from observational point of view? Actually, not much, because it requires observations uh, in, in very low 
uh, flux state. So we need very flexible and sensitive X-ray telescopes. But still, the first evidence of uh, transition to the propeller effect was found already 30 years ago, when uh, during the fading phase of, of, of the outbursts from this well-known pulsar of E032 plus 53, the pulsar just disappeared sharply below some critical luminosity. Uh, some evidence of the propeller regime, of the propeller effect was found in this Giro J7044 using strong variations of pulsed fraction and uh, flux, and in uh, this famous millisecond pulsar, SAX J808, where some multiple transitions between accretion regime and propeller regime was, were observed in the tail of the outburst. Actually, that's it. So what, would, what we decided to do is to use uh, modern telescopes in order to obtain as many examples of such transitions as possible. So what do we need? We need uh, to catch outbursts from transient X-ray pulsars covering a wide range of mass accretion rates. Uh, it's very desirable to have independently measured values of magnetic field to be able to calibrate this method. And of course, we need sensitive and flexible X-ray telescope. And for this project, we use uh, a Swift XRT telescope. So we started this project uh, a couple of years ago, and we were quite lucky. During the last few years, we detected uh, several outbursts from uh, these three classical X-ray pulsars. Uh, here you can see their light curves. And what is great about this source is that we know everything about them. We know uh, pulse periods. We know magnetic fields from measurements from the cyclotron lines. And we know distances. So we can convert the fluxes into mass accretion rates. And this is the results for these three sources. So as we expected, uh, in, in all of them, in, in, in the tail of the outburst, after some gradual decrease of the luminosity, we observed huge, sharp drops of, of the fluxes by a factor of 100 during only one or maybe slightly more than one day. This is exactly what we expected in the case of transition to the propeller effect, to the propeller regime. And uh, another piece of evidence of the stopped accretion comes not only from uh, temporal behavior, but also from, temporal, uh, from spectral analysis. So this red spectra for these two sources are shown just before the, this transition. So you can see that they are quite hard, can be approximated with the power law, which, which is typical for uh, accreting X-ray pulsars. And immediately after this transition, the spectrum changed completely. It, uh, it is soft, black body, with temperature of about 0.5 keV. And this is exactly what we can expect if accretion is stopped and we see just cooling uh, neutron star. OK, unfortunately, in, 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 uh, in SMCX2, we didn't detect this low level emission because it's quite far away. OK, now what we can do, we can try to summarize all these examples of transition into one diagram. What is shown here? Uh, here, on x-axis, is shown the strength of magnetic field determined with completely independent method. Uh, in the majority cases, it's just uh, cyclotron lines. And here, we have combination of limiting luminosity for transition to the propeller regime and pulse period in this strange power, as you can see from this equation, this combination, luminosity and this uh, pulse period, is proportional to the magnetic field strengths. So this, these lines uh, show the prediction from this equation. So in some sense, this is also uh, magnetic field strengths. And you can see that measurements obtained from this method, from observations of propeller effect, and independent <coughs> methods coincide very well. 
So it means that we can use these uh, methods, this method, to determine magnetic field in neutron stars even if we do not see any spectral features, for example, in this spectrum. Okay, now, then we apply this method to recently discovered uh, first pulsating ULX in M82, the source is called M82X2. Uh, so what we found that uh, in, in the Chandra data, the source can be either very bright, it's shown here, or it almost gone. If, if you analyze the light curve of this source, you will find that you, you can find it in bright state or in, in the faint state. And the distribution of fluxes is clearly bimodal. So obviously we interpreted this behavior as transitions between uh, accretion regime and propeller regime. We use again this very simple equation and we got estimate for the uh, field strength in this system about 10 to 14 Gauss, which is actually uh, coincide with independent, independently measured value from, from the accretion column model proposed by Alexander Mushtakov. Okay, now I, I will switch uh, to another topic. So this is another source. Of course, we detected outbursts not only from three classical pulsars. Uh, this is another one, Jiro J1008. Uh, so again, we know everything about this source, pulse period, magnetic field, distance. And of course, we expected to use this source again just to calibrate this propeller effect. Uh, model, and we expect it to, to detect transition to the propeller regime. And since we know everything, we can easily predict where we expected to see this transition, slightly below 10 to 34 Earths per second. But surprisingly, during the fading phase of the outburst, the source switched to some quasi-stable accretion and stuck to about 10 to 35 Earths per second. Why it is surprising? Uh, to, to understand it, we have to refer to physics of accretion disks, or better to say to disk instability model, which claims that uh, stable accretion uh, in, at high mass accretion rates requires that the disk should be in hot state. It should be completely ionized and the temperature everywhere in the disk should be above 6.5 thousand Kelvin. If for some reason at outer radius of accretion disk uh, temperature falls below this uh, critical value, then <clears throat> it causes a uh, change of the viscosity, accretion rate drops, and uh, it happens at smaller and smaller radius, radii, and so-called so uh, cooling waves start to propagate from, uh, from the outer radius of accretion disk towards compact object, and we should observe very fast decay of, of the mass accretion rate, of the luminosity, until uh, source will transit to, to the propeller regime. Okay, but actually this is not the only regime of uh, stable accretion. Mass accretion rate should be so high to to, to have uh, accretion disk in, in, in the hot state, or mass accretion rate should be so low to have uh, all the whole disk in the cold state. And here we have some equations from Lasota. And now this R is actually inner radius of, uh, of the accretion disk. But since we are talking about X-ray pulsars, we know what is the inner radius of the accretion disk. It's magnetospheric radius. So now we can uh, substitute magnetospheric radius to this equation and get expression for this critical luminosity when the whole disk becomes uh, cold, completely recombined. And as you can see, it depends only on the magnetic field strength. Now we can come back to this source, zero J. 10 or 8, we know magnetic field, it's about 10 to 13 Gauss. And if we will put it here, we will get 
this critical luminosity about 10 to 35 Hertz per second. Now we can check again the light curve, and you can see that it should happen somewhere here. So we consider this, this behavior of the source as first evidence of stable accretion uh, from completely cold recombined accretion disk in the case of, of X-ray pulsars. Okay, now we can try to answer the question, can we predict in advance which source will end up its outburst uh, in which state? Actually, it's quite easy to do. We, we should just to equal this limiting luminosity for the propeller regime onset and this critical luminosity for, for the cold disk. And so both equations depend only on uh, pulse period and magnetic field. And it means that we can introduce some critical pulse period, which divides all X3 pulsars into two groups. And it depends only on the magnetic field strength. So it is shown here. So this equation is shown with, uh, with the line. So if pulse period is below this critical value, then it rotates uh, fast enough to produce a uh, centrifugal barrier before the disk is able to, to switch to the cold disk, to the cold state. And we will observe this source uh, in, in the propeller regime, finally. And actually, for, for the majority of these sources, we already uh, observed them in, in, in the propeller regime. And above this, uh, this period, uh, neutron star rotates too slowly to, to switch to the propeller. And this critical luminosity for the cold disk will uh, happen before. Okay, so I, I came to my conclusions. So first of all, we organized uh, observational campaign for observations of uh, X-ray pulsars with the Swift X-ray telescope, and during a couple of last years, we were quite lucky, we detected a few transitions. We were able to use this data to calibrate this method to determine independently uh, magnetic fields in these sources, and we applied it, it to uh, first pulsating ULX, MIT2X2, and obtained value of about 10 to 14 Gauss in this system. And also we discovered first evidence for accretion from cold recombined disk in X-ray pulsars. And we proposed some, some method how to determine before the observations if we will be able to observe transition to the propeller effect in some particular source. Thank you. So uh, you didn't uh, mention the evolution of the spin period during these different phases. Is, is there a clear uh, change between spin up and spin down between the accretion and propeller uh, phases? Unfortunately, unfortunately, uh, the, so as I said, we need very sensitive uh, telescopes. So unfortunately, we do not see pulsations. We cannot just because there are too low count rate in, uh, in this state, especially in, in, uh, in propeller regime. So you, you did say, though, that all of these systems, or the ones you talked about at the beginning, had known spin periods. So are they, yes. are they determined in the accretion phase? Or? Yes, sure, when they're bright. So there are these um, accreting black holes in some low mass X-ray binaries that show also very large variations in flux towards the end of the outbursts. And as you go to the low luminosities, they show a softening of the energy spectrum. And I was wondering, 
whether you have tried to compare this phenomenology with what you see in systems like uh, for you or 115 and so on, so that, in other words, how sure are we that what we are observing is something related to the compact object rather than some accretion flow of phenomenology? In case of X repulsors, we have two large uh, inner radio and inner radii of accretion disks. So actually, I don't think we expect at all emission from from the from the accretion disk and accretion flow. So in the case of uh, black holes, we we do expect, and here we we don't. So I think the physics is different. You used the luminosity in the propeller regime, where you uh, put the magnetosphere radius instead of neutron star radius to, to, to estimate the luminosity. It's fine, but my question is, what is the emission mechanism uh, which provides this luminosity? I, I mean, physical, physical emission mechanism uh, and... Um, so which spectrum would you expect in the propeller regime? Uh, okay, yeah. Uh, as I said, the radius, magnetospheric, magnetospheric radius, is uh, very large in, in accretion disk. And we do not expect any X-rays from... Uh, so first of all, what, what, what mechanism? So it's so-called uh, magnetospheric accretion. So we still have accretion, so matter still comes to the magnetosphere, it releases its energy, and it's called magnetospheric accretion model. But uh, since the temperature is too low, so we do not expect any emission in X-rays. Okay, but, uh, but you do expect some emission. At which energies? Temperature should be about 10 electron volts. So ultraviolet or... Okay, so it is ultraviolet, <laughs> but... the. Uh... So what, what is the, the mechanism? Is it just what emission from really or from warm plasma? Maybe, yeah. And, and is it observable at all? No, because it's high mass X-ray binaries and uh, optical companion optical compa companions it's are very brighter. very bright. So okay. we do not expect uh, to see uh -huh. some changes of emission due to this uh, magnetospheric accretion. Uh -huh. so and what, what we can analyze only only X-ray emission. I see. Somewhat related question: Do we expect what what, what happens with this matter which is thrown out by the propeller? Do we expect some outflows from the system, or it remains bound somehow in, in this binary or what? Yeah. Also, it model dependent. Yeah, there are a lot of different models. And also it depends on uh, how different is the magnetospheric radius and co-rotation radius. So there are some models of so-called dead disks, when we have just collecting some matter in the dead disk, which is not accreting. Or, yeah, we can expect some outflows. Yeah, sure. But they are apparently unobservable, based on what you... Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, do you see pulsation in the cold disk, uh, in the cold disk state. Do you see pulsations in X-rays? Uh, actually, no, again, because of statistics. So, so we can put all to, the, on the upper limits, so below, I don't remember, 20%. Okay. Any more questions? Okay, let's uh, thank Sergey, and if the next speaker gets uh, set up.